Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Vilnius uh, Tech Leads. Uh, today we have a hybrid event. Some of you are here in front of me, and some of you are watching this event online. And some of you are probably watching this event sometime in the future, long after this event is done. So Vilnius Tech Leads is, uh, uh, for those of you un uninitiated, is a, a tech leadership meetup group. And in this meetup group, we talk all kinds of uh, technical leadership topics. Uh, for, and uh, we expect people, technical leaders and those people that aspire to be technical leaders to visit this uh, meetup group. All of our meetups have a team. And today's team is uh, build versus buy. I think that if you're into technology and you work with technology, you're probably familiar with this quandary. Uh, you have to either choose to buy some kind of technology uh, that is specific for your need, and then you can st start using it immediately. Or you can build some kind of technology, and then you can build it really specifically for your needs, and that has its, kind of, its uh, kind of advantages. Today, we're going to discuss this topic of, of build versus buy. And we have, as usual in Vilnius Tech Leads, three speakers ready to share their stories about build versus buy. Uh, the three speakers are Odrus, Lucas, and Roman. And uh, in a couple of minutes, we'll, 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 we will start with the story from Odrus. Uh, after each uh, story, we have a Q we'll have a Q&A. So if you have questions in the audience, please raise your hand. And if you have questions watching the stream online, please write those questions in the YouTube comments section. Uh, for those of you here uh, in, in our Vinted HQ, uh, feel free to share in the drinks and food. And uh, I hope that uh, those watching online are also enjoying a nice meal. And now, without further ado, uh, let me introduce to you Odrus, who will tell us his story about build versus buy. Hello, everyone. So my name is Odrus. Uh, I worked at home to go and uh, it's a pleasure to be invited here uh, to share experience uh, with, with the community. And thanks for having me here. Uh, I work at home to go for eight years and uh, today I'm going to share one of home to go stories when we faced build versus buy dilemma uh, at a customer engagement marketing automation domain. So before we start, let me give some context what we do. Uh, Home2Go is largest vacation rental search engine in the marketplace. Uh, we have the most of the supply uh, on our website, uh, so the user has the best variety of accommodation options uh, in one place. We are especially proud of our on-site solutions, uh, so uh, users are capable uh, directly at home to go website uh, to make a reservation and payment for the their dream vacation rental uh, without leaving home to go with consistency, consistent UI, uh, consistent experience, uh, which is very important. Important so we make uh, most of accommodation options available in one place. So, what was the challenge? We knew that inspiring newsletter uh, is very important and integral part of the overall uh, user experience and uh, with the product. Uh, so especially for users who might be looking for inspiration uh, or hot deals on our platform, or for the users who already booked with us and they are looking for new opportunity to spend their next vacation. So it's a, it's a huge driver for the repurchase. So definitely it's very important area to make and keep this connection uh, with our users. Uh, and yeah, we had a team around it, around the topic. Uh, we had uh, basically a tree uh, or with the 20 branches of different uh, user journey uh, steps uh, and variations. We had transactional emails and we've been experimenting with it. So every month we had one or two experiments 
usually only with the content uh, we deliver to our users. Uh, it was in-house solution uh, with the PHP application uh, on the Symfony framework. Uh, all, all the journeys and most of the configuration was there in code. Uh, we had sort of asset management system to manage our assets like text and pictures. Uh, it had UI, but uh, most of the journeys was, uh, was in code. Uh, and uh, we used SendGrid for physical email sending as send out partner. Uh, we had a team of two product managers, uh, three backend engineers, uh, and one data analyst. And we faced a problem that we are getting slower at innovation. Right? So uh, we had those experiments, but we see that there are so many opportunities. So we, we have to increase this velocity. And key velocity killers were missing transparency. Uh, Engineers spend a lot of time to figure out uh, and answer the question why specific user uh, received this email while the content was like, like that, or why this user didn't receive something. Right? So we spend quite a lot of time just on debugging, understanding what's happening in the system. And experimentation, not only with content, uh, but with different send times, it might be that some users would prefer uh, to receive a newsletter on Sunday while other others on Monday morning. So uh, there was a need for experimentation with the send out times. Uh, also uh, with the segmentation, uh, and uh, the journey types. Maybe, maybe some other users could prefer push notification instead of email, channel versus channel experimentation. This was simply not happening. Uh, and yeah, multi-channel, as I mentioned, and uh, customer support tool integration was missing because if the user is calling a support agent and complaining that booking was canceled for whatever reason, probably we shouldn't send newsletter in that time. Yeah, so we are we're not good enough uh, at these areas. So there was a need for a better software and for a higher velocity. How we make the decision what to do? Of course, we had good arguments to build, yeah, because we already had a high-end search service for vacation rentals. Of course, this is what we do. Uh, some default software, uh, most of those support, uh, encourages basically to uh, push all of your inventory into the system, and then they have algorithms and template system to allowing to put the products and offers right into the email, right, but we knew that won't work for us since searching for vacation rentals is something we do. It's our competitive advantages. This is where we're good at. So we definitely need to use our component here, uh, as well as design system. And home to go we operate with multiple brands at once. Uh, we have acquisitions like Wimdu, Tripping, Casamundo, uh, right? So it works on the same system, uh, it's just different theme, different design, uh, and uh, we invested a lot of time uh, basically to move forward with the design system and consistently support uh, the looks and feel of all those brands at once. So basically the behavior and the theme was well separated, and again, uh, we had doubts that any kind of third-party system could support something like that. And we knew we were go going to need it. Also, we had a good arguments to buy. Yeah, we saw, uh, let's say this is a screenshot, screenshot from Brace, uh, and uh, it has advanced UI allowing uh, with the graphical interface to map user journey, to have different branches of user experience, uh, delays, timing, segmentation, right? Everything is there, and to build that kind of tool for a transparency, that might take weeks or even months, right? So it's a big investment. Uh, as well as of segmentation, right? Uh, dynamic querying uh, with the easy UI product managers are capable to create new segment, like in this case, all the users who had uh, something in their wish list for a while, yeah, just a manager without any technical skills can basically to create that kind of segment of 
customers. Uh, it's a valuable thing to do for velocity and experimentation. Uh, and the multi-channel as well. Uh, if we do it completely in-house, we need to integrate uh, every new notification channel, like push notifications, SMS, and so on. Uh, while with the third-party software, it's the matter of uh, yeah, I I integration and configuration. So, we thought, all right, we have good arguments for build, we have good arguments for buy, but what if there exists one software uh, where we could modularize it a bit and to use modules like the joiner mapper, uh, which we need uh, with the third party, but all the components which we have and we are already good at to keep from our system. So easy integration uh, was uh, the key and uh, we've been looking for that kind of software. Uh, to integrate with our search service, uh, with our website, with our content services, uh, tracking services, and customer support. We use Salesforce for customer support. And uh, we found quite a few, and we made a short list out of that. And here is a highly simplified comparison table we had back then. Uh, and uh, I must admit, it was very close competition. Uh, eventually, we ended up with Brace, uh, even if Salesforce was already used as our customer support tool for our customer support agents. Uh, but Salesforce has uh, had a very friendly data inflow interfaces, so we ended up with Brace. Uh, of course, there was a price component, uh, but I will discuss this uh, a bit later. So once we selected Brace, uh, how we executed the migration. Here is, again, highly simplified roadmap. So on the second week, uh, we had uh, data import and ingestion into Brace. Uh, so uh, we had users, uh, user data, relevant user data inside already. Uh, on week five, uh, we uh, employed journey builder from Brace for our needs. So the journey was built on Brace, all the scheme I have showed before. Uh, just the triggering and the rest of the system worked uh, as before, right? So we found a way from Brace basically to trigger uh, API gateways. Uh, uh, so we send uh, the email or any notification in the same way like we did, bef uh, we did before. Uh, on the week nine, uh, we already uh, tested a smaller market of ours, uh, fully operated by Brace. And uh, one week later, we had proof of concept uh, for first A-B test, and that was successful. Uh, experimenting was very important for us back then. Uh, and the uh, rest of the time, was more operational, basically switching market by market, warming up the IPs, uh, and uh, making sure that monitoring and making sure that everything is in order. So I wouldn't say it's, it, it was an active work, uh, and all executed by three backend engineers with the sporadic support from front end engineers and uh, data engineers as well. Of course, we faced some unexpected challenges. Uh, once you are dealing with the third-party software, you need to uh, take some of the rules uh, enforced by the software. Uh, for example, I, we wanted to have a really fast welcome notification for certain kind of customers. Uh, so we decided that, okay, we uh, push some initial data uh, into Brace right from the website. And the default solution was uh, basically that we include JavaScript snippet uh, into website and, and basically every customer event and every customer data goes into Brace. Turns out those uh, events might get quite expensive because it's, it's a price for the usage. Uh, so we had to tweak it a bit to make sure that we start 
uh, sending the data to Brace from the website only uh, when the customer logins or subscribes. Yeah? So it highly reduced this uh, event rate. Uh, but we had to tweak it since we had to keep some kind of the context in the browser memory uh, to make sure that in case user would subscribe, we can send this context to the brace. So some custom work. Again, there, are, there, there were some other rules. Uh, since we had in-house solution, uh, we used to do quite crazy stuff uh, with selecting the perfect vacation rentals for user. Uh, so we had heavy algorithms to find absolutely the best price uh, or best discount in the given time range for the user. That took quite a while. Uh, also machine learning algorithms uh, to select perfect accommodation uh, this user might be interested into. So that took few seconds uh, while the brace had default uh, and unchangeable uh, API uh, call timeouts of two seconds. And we face this challenge that we cannot send some of the emails for our user. And actually, solution proposal came up from the Brace consultants. They say, hey, what if you, uh, once we need to send some notification, uh, you initiate content generator uh, with the API call from the Brace, and you do it asynchronous at the home to go systems. So once we have content, we prepare it, uh, we have a queue of the emails or notifications we need to provide with the content. And once it's ready, we post this content back to Brace and the whole journey uh, resumes. That was quite elegant solution. We are happy about it. The conclusion. Yeah, so we have Brace by now uh, as a key tool for uh, customer engagement marketing automation. We have push notifications. Uh, implemented, that was quite easy. Uh, we have three or four monthly A-B tests, so twice we had before, uh, including journey tests, uh, including timing uh, and a channel versus channel. Uh, incredible change of transparency. We didn't even realize how much time engineers spent uh, to debug and to deliver explanations uh, why user content uh, behaves like, like that. Yeah? So we, we save a lot of time. Uh, valuable know-how we gained from Brace consultants. Turns out there, there's a lot of to learn, uh, especially in email de deliverability, uh, reputation of the IP addresses and things like that. So we learned a lot. And uh, I would say we still have the weak vendor lock-in. Yeah? So since we developed a good uh, gateway interfaces uh, from our system to Brace, uh, we think that it would be pretty easy if sometime we would like to change something uh, to change with something else. So how to summarize what we do at home to go once we, fa we face a build versus buy dilemma? Uh, it comes a lot with our uh, mission making incredible homes easy accessible to everyone. So uh, ideal home is the key for every team, the trip. This is what we believe in. And this is what we do. This is what we are good at. And whenever it's possible, if there exists industry standard uh, software we can buy, we usually do it because we want to focus our engineering minds into our competitive advantages like search, uh, inventory, checkout, user experience, right? Uh, all, all those things uh, which are specific for us and usually you cannot even buy those things. Uh, since we are not looking that much into uh, saving costs by doing something in-house. Uh, we are prioritizing bid back, bid big bets and uh, looking for high ROIs. Uh, it does not make sense for us just uh, to choose something, to do something in-house uh, while we are looking for uh, enablers and uh, velocity boosters. If there exists software that, we can, that can make us twice faster, uh, it means that we can uh, have faster feedback loops uh, to get more knowledge, 
new learnings uh, and eventually to improve our business. There is plenty of industry standard uh, software we buy. Salesforce for customer support, uh, Brace for marketing automation, uh, New Relic for uh, observability, uh, Snowflake for data warehouse, SageMaker for machine, machine learning uh, and training. Right? So every of those things, in theory, you could build some parts of those systems in-house, but uh, we focus on our competitive advantages. Having said that, uh, we have some tools uh, where exist a lot of variety of standard software, like the A-B testing tool. There are plenty of those, but we still have the in-house one because we do a lot of experimentation. Uh, at home to go website, there might be up to actually even more than 100 experiments and A-B tests running at once. Uh, so this is something we do heavily. Uh, and together with the feature toggles, with web event tracking, with logging, uh, with reporting, uh, everything is so deep integrated and it makes it well-oiled machine so we can do experimentation uh, and uh, get new learnings really fast. So we had that kind of tool uh, built in-house. Special thanks goes to Aiste Stromkauskas, Thomas Scholmeyer, and uh, Ramuna Skarbalius. Uh, they uh, worked hands-on on this project quite a lot, and uh, they provided me with valuable feedback and uh, the context for the speech. So thank you, guys, if you're uh, looking at me right now. And yeah, everyone here and looking at us online, uh, if you like my presentation or if you have feedback, let's connect. Uh, let's make a connection. Uh, here's uh, the link to LinkedIn profile. And thank you. Thank you, Odrus. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you so that our audience on YouTube could, could be able to hear us. At the same time, I'll check out whatever we have some questions on on, on YouTube. And I'll just like to comment that uh, we at Vinted also built our own A-B testing system, so I fully understand why you need to have something like that fully integrated into your stack. So, next, so, one question here. so before uh, any transformation happened, it looked like you had like, three backend developers in your product software development team, right? And then you decide to source external vendor. And then it brings other challenges than software development, like ownership, configuration, tracking, and so, what it required some organizational or process changes to manage vendors when you have this buy case? Uh, good question, thank you. Uh, I cannot tell uh, that uh, somehow we changed team very dramatically. Uh, we have way more analysts, we have way more product managers uh, since they are capable to do quite a lot of things uh, as a self-service, so they don't need engineering uh, minds that much. Engineers at the same time, uh, those the same engineers working even right now, is just on the different topics they are focusing on right now. And, and it's more about uh, what's the better content for the users, uh, completely different campaigns or use cases, or completely new uh, type of journeys uh, we want to support. So the goal was to increase the velocity of innovation, so we feel that we did it. Uh, organizational changes, uh, yeah, you need to uh, talk to consultants time, times to time to renew the contracts, but I wouldn't say that this is like the huge amount of time changing something. You also said that uh, you, you would consider uh, buying some kind of enablers on velocity boosters, and you get, said, said something like, if it increases our speed 2x or something like that. Do you have any examples of that kind of software that you, that you already bought? Uh, yes, so one of the recent ones we are experimenting basically, uh, we, we haven't selected the tool yet, right, but it, it's something that's ongoing, uh, but uh, we see that we need uh, 
to detect anomalies in data, even before someone might see that, okay, something is off, or default alert, uh, basically alert that someone configured, uh, tells that something is not right. Uh, we need proactive software for looking for anomalies into data without too, too much context. So uh, here we had, uh, we haven't selected the tool yet, uh, but we see that uh, doing POCs uh, showed already uh, valuable results. So once you receive the email uh, from, I don't know, uh, from the analyst that what's happening uh, in this area, click-through rate is going down, uh, you might already have insights uh, before someone already noticed. Yeah, so we, I already see that this will make a big change for us. Do we have any more questions in the audience? Uh, one more question. I just wanted to check about the personal data because I don't think you have covered this topic. So build versus buy, then you submit information outside of your own premises. As I understand, you are sending quite a lot of information to get marketing automation. How does that come into play for your consideration? Uh, thank you, good question. Uh, so it's not that different if you build or buy, right? Uh, it's again, uh, we respect user private data, uh, and uh, we use that data only if uh, there's a clear consent from, from the user uh, to do it. Uh, it's just if you're using third party, uh, you signed a data processing agreement with your trusted partner. Uh, it same goes, yeah, it's a marketing automation, but basically it's the same data process agreement uh, if you are on cloud, right? Again, because you are not owned, owning the data uh, on, uh, in your infrastructure, it's in a cloud, which is again third party partner. So as long as it's, it's, there is agreement, uh, partner has a good reputation and they knows what they're doing, uh, especially uh, with marketing automation, uh, they already know how to process customer private data, so it's, uh, I wouldn't say that it's that much different if you build or buy. Thank you. Any, any more questions? I think that's it. So again, thank you, Odris. <laughs> thank you all. And now uh, for our next speaker, uh, we have Lucas. So Lucas, if you're ready. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, my name is Lucas and I am a, wait, just need to click here, um, and I am a machine learning uh, platform team uh, lead uh, here at Vinted. Um, and I've been here at Vinted for eight months now, um, and actually for the majority of this time I've been one of those, uh, you know, yet another build versus buy decisions. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact for us it wasn't really as much about build versus buy, uh, but rather which tools do we buy and how many. Um, and uh, it was great uh, listening to Audrey's talk. I think I've seen uh, a lot of common, common themes and common things with us. Um, and sadly, I, don't, I haven't covered any of the data processing questions here in my talk. Uh, but if you answer me, the answer is the same as what Audrey just said, because it's exactly the same. <laughs> um, so yeah, so let me start from uh, what do we do? Uh, what do we do as a, as a machine learning platform team? Um, and I think the best way to cover that is through our mission statement. So um, here at, um, in, in our team, we have our own uh, mission. Um, we are an internal team, um, and we are making our platform for, for users, for data, science, data scientists uh, at Minted Teams. Um, and our goal is to make it easy to build and maintain high quality machine learning products for all teams at Minted. And there are really two parts in it uh, that I want to emphasize. Um, one is on the user focus. Um, so because we are really focusing on making sure that they all can do uh, machine learning uh, models and products with the least inf interference from our team as possible, uh, we're really focusing on making sure that 
you know, the platform um, and, and, and everything we do, the tools that we're, we're giving them are as usable as possible, as, as, as accessible as possible. So that's one focus. Um, the, the other side is obviously the value that we create, right? You can't just create a platform that is fun to use. Um, we also need to make sure uh, that the products uh, or the machine learning models that our users create are of the highest quality. Um, so we are building tools uh, for code, data, and models uh, to be efficient, reliable, secure, etc. Um, a lot of these things are actually uh, machine learning uh, specific, um, and it's really important for us to cover those. So, you know, what's 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 the situation? What's the situation when I when I came in and still is? Um, so, you know, at the beginning, um, the, pl the platform uh, has been like, been started to be built around two years ago, I think. Um, and uh, initially, you know, machine learning was just growing, uh, just being started at Vinted. And the first initial goal of the, t of, of, of the team was to prove that machine learning brings any value to Vinted, right? Initially, we, we weren't sure um, if, if, it, if it makes sense to have it. So obviously, you can imagine that obviously there are no considerations of buying um, anything off the shelf, uh, but rather just using some open source tools uh, to begin with. Um, however, suddenly, at some point, we just realized, OK, we hit the stage where we completed it. Uh, we've seen a lot of people, um, like a lot of um, data scientists, uh, building the models, a lot of people uh, requesting for models. So we realized, OK, the value has been created. We had some couple of models already running successfully in production. So out of, like, suddenly, uh, the, the, the goal of the machine learning platform became to actually acceler accelerate value creation. And as you can imagine, that was a completely different proposition, and we had to start thinking, okay, how, maybe, maybe there is something different we should be doing. But it, it wasn't only that. Um, we, there were another uh, thing that we were facing uh, at that point back in, back in May, back in April. Uh, it was the growing demands of our users. Um, so we knew that we were in trouble when our backlog um, has grown to more than 100 items, um, and you know, we weren't really coping with it. And you know, some of those features uh, that we had in the backlog were so huge that they could easily you know, be another team, really. You know, some of the examples, I won't go too deep into it, but if you're interested, we can talk about it after. You know, we, we, we needed a more um, usable and connected system, model experimentation, monitoring tools, automated pipelines, feature store. Literally, there are like, whole companies being built around like, each of these uh, items. So we knew that we are in trouble. Um, and, you know, initially we tried to cope with the demand, we tried to build it, because uh, obviously we, we didn't know what else to do. Um, and uh, like we failed, we couldn't. We, our backlog was still as large as always, as before, and it wasn't, it was, if, if it wasn't the same, uh, yeah, it was probably, it, at, at best it was the same. It was always more than 100 items, as I remember being it was in, in, in this team. Um, so that was, uh, that was our challenge, and we realized, okay, we probably need to think about uh, maybe we can buy something off the shelf at this stage. So now, um, I, from, from this point, I want to talk a little bit about our, our, our process of how we did it. So uh, just, to, just to let you know, we still haven't actually decided on the platform, um, as, as, as it's, a, it's, it's a huge one that we need. Um, so I, I want to talk a little about you know, what, what did we do during this, this period and what was our experience with it. But to begin with, I want to add a couple of complications that we had uh, from the very beginning, at, and, and we still are having it, uh, that made this whole decision and project even, even more complicated. So first was our constraints, so our platform, like our, our model training is being done on the cloud, uh, but some other parts like data warehouse or serving is are on, on the premise. So that was quite complicated considering that we knew that there are some considerations of, uh, you know, maybe these parts also can migrate somewhere, maybe not, maybe these constraints will get relaxed, maybe not, but we don't know when and we don't know if. So we need to work around those, we need to actually plan, you know, if we're buying something, how well they're going to work under all these circumstances. The second part is machine learning operations, uh, so the field that you're in, uh, is a super fresh and constantly evolving field. Um, and there are tools being created as we speak. Every day there is a new, like, so something new being created. Uh, there is no clear leader in the space. Uh, you know, 
Google Cloud Platform are trying to like, just, just, just talking to us about the roadmaps, promising us what we're going to build in 2020. Um, and you know, it, it adds another complication for us. Uh, because we don't know if we can, you know, if, if this tool that we select will keep up our, pro their, our promises, um, will someone else will become big? We don't know that, so it adds another complication into it. However, for us, um, at least one thing we weren't really considering was a bill case. So for us, um, we knew that we will probably, um, we, will, we will definitely buy something, um, you know, if it's not going to be the end-to-end -end solution that you could look for. Uh, then maybe we'll, hide, we'll find some of those specialist tools, one or two, uh, definitely, definitely at least one, uh, that we can incorporate in our whole stack um, so that we can solve our problem, problem of having, you know, uh, not coping with the demand. And to be honest, um, I think again, uh, just reflecting on Audrey's point, I think personally I also think that if you're not on a, uh, like if it's not your main business area and you're a fast-paced environment, I think you should always consider buying at the very least. I think the opportunity cost is just too, too high. And uh, so, you know, what, 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 what's the other problem? The other problem is, okay, so how do you decide uh, which of those tools do you actually buy? And I think I, I very like to come back to, uh, to, 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 to this statement, um, back to our mission. Um, I feel like constantly we, are, we forget about it uh, in our team, and it's, it's great to remind ourselves that you know, we have to look at our mission. So what is, what is our true goal? Uh, because when you, when you talk to all those vendors, uh, they, they show you all those nice, shiny features, and you forget what you're really here for, um, it's really good to come back and remember that, okay, this is what we need to focus on. And just to come back to our mission, for us it was users and, uh, and, and, and a high quality machine learning, right? So if, if the platform that we are selecting, if the tools that we are building are not actually useful for and, and they can't use, our users can't use it, and if the machine learning uh, products that they build using that platform are not, not the greatest, uh, then what's the point of buying that platform, right? Um, so that, that, that's what we were uh, focusing a lot. And I really want to emphasize the users uh, because I think that um, even we are being an internal team and even the team that, you know, being building something for someone else to use, uh, there's always users, even if in internally, that are using your product. And um, focusing on them is, was super important and for us, it, it, allows, it allowed us to keep focus for what are we trying to achieve. So now I actually want to just go through the process that we went through. Um, again, as I said, we haven't finished this yet, uh, but we've done a lot of steps. Um, and I just want to show you in, in, in two verticals what we were doing, what was our thought process. So on the left, I'm going to show the things that we've been doing as a team. And on the right, um, what did we use our users for? On what, 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 what did we ask them or what we asked them to do? So we started with identifying the needs. Um, so machine learning platform wasn't, you know, wasn't just one specific thing that we have to do. And we knew that there are a lot of things that people use it for. So we started with user interviews. And, and users, um, it obviously I mean data scientists, data analysts, uh, data engineers, we try to interview them, we try to understand what are their real problems, what are their day-to-day -day challenges, um, you know, what are they working on every day. So that was very important to, to learn a bit what do we need to build. Um, we then more moved, like, walked away and uh, into, within the team, um, we tried to draw a user journey map to understand how all of these parts and steps in their, in their daily life uh, relate together. We identified the main risks um, and other considerations that we need to think about before making a decision. Um, and we also, oh, and, and just this is how our uh, uh, user map looked at uh, after that one day of workshop that we've done. Um, and if anyone's interested, we, we, we followed the design sprint uh, day one uh, of, of the suggestion. Um, and then we also asked the stakeholders for their feedback to understand if, okay, uh, are we understanding these problems clear? Are all of the like, journeys are the same as you, you see it? So they added some valuable feedback for us as well. Um, and after this, we, we listed around like 75 features. Again, we knew it's, 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 a, it's a massive number. Um, and some of those features were like feature store, where again, I, I, I drew in, like showed in the beginning, 
it's like the one that could actually be the whole like whole team building it. Um, and I think now when I look back at it, um, we we probably made a mistake here. We should have spent more time, even more time, talking to our users and actually mapping those features into user stories, really understanding, okay, so what is, um, what is that they're trying to achieve rather than what features do we need? Um, so after, after we've done this, uh, we went in and, and did some quick um, sourcing of the tools. Um, we did the tool search within a team. We quickly found a gazillion of, of different tools that you could use. We also asked our users uh, for tool ideas uh, because we wanted to make sure that maybe there's something they like to learn, uh, they like to use, maybe something used in the past, and we wanted to take their feedback in so that you consider these tools as well. Um, we quickly noticed and realized that, okay, this is way more tools than we can actually review and, 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 and compare. So what we did, we realized that after um, user interviews, we realized that people anyway prefer having one tool rather than 10 different tools, just so that it's easier to work on one. So we focused on end-to-end -end tools that can cover as much of our problems as possible. And uh, we knew that, okay, if, if there are the smaller ones later, we can, uh, we can fill it in. Um, so we ended up with 15 tools, uh, 15 different tools, and I think it's still too many for me to list them here. Um, so what we did, what we did next, um, we then spent uh, some time contacting them, contacting vendors, and doing the demos of them and looking for deal breakers. So we did it within the team. Um, and the main deal breakers we were looking for were actually, okay, if we chose this platform, uh, this tool, is it gonna stop us from doing something? So some of the tools didn't allow us to use GPUs for training. So we knew, okay, you can't use them. Obviously, there's no way around it. Um, some other tools were actually not adding anything extra because we were, we were just platforms at their early, early stages as well. Um, so we quickly disqualified those as well. And we, I think, ended up with around seven, seven, eight tools at that point. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, now we realize that, okay, the features that we have listed before, they are not enough to decide um, which of these tools are great because they're all offering it, but we don't really know if the specific needs of the user are actually covered. So we went, uh, like we spent some time to actually review our feature list at that point and translate them into the user story. So basically, what is, like, how does users see those uh, problems and what he needs to achieve? And we did it. We asked more of feedback from, from the users, from our data scientists. Um, they filled it in some, some, some extra items. They gave us feedback. And, and actually, it was also a useful, uh, useful practice to do that. Um, and then we were spending one or two weeks for each of the tools uh, trialing them. Um, Again, um, it, took us, it took us more time than we uh, probably expected, um, but we were just looking for more of those uh, you know, deal breakers. Um, and, 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 and one extra thing we did after all of these trials, we did pairing sessions with our users. So we did two hour sessions uh, with four people each uh, for each platform, showing them around the platform, gathering their feedback, trying to understand if their problems are being covered in it, and then getting the feedback of whether their problems are, you know, they can actually see this platform use, useful or not. And we use that to then uh, come up with a final free uh, options. And now I can tell you what they are because it's only free. And it was, and it is still Data EQ, um, AWS uh, SageMaker, and uh, uh, GCP's Vertex AI, the new offering that they have. So now we move them into the pretty much final stages, uh, a proof of concept, where we spend around a month building a proof of concept uh, with Data EQ now. Um, and you know, it's basically a technical evaluation that you know, now we're to trying to build uh, and, 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 and take this uh, platform and uh, fit to our constraints, use our data, uh, try, to, try to test the platform and see if it, if it works for most of those user stories that we have. Um, and again, we turned back to users and we asked them to, for help. We asked them to use the platform, use, use it together with us, and individually build the use cases that they care about, that they care about in their daily life, and again, um, share they, their feedback. Um, we also started the procurement processes quite early. 
uh, at this stage. Uh, so before we even selected which one do we prefer and which one we want to buy, um, we started them um, so that whenever, whenever we are ready to buy, we can actually do it much faster and we can start using it because um, these processes take really long time. Um, and you remember the constraints that I mentioned earlier? So uh, these are also back into our game. Um, we noticed and we, quick, it, 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 we quickly realized that, okay, um, it will be hard uh, to find a platform that can work for pretty much all of those uh, constraints. We're actually impacting our decision quite a lot. Um, so what we're doing right now, we're defining different plans uh, for, 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 for constraint scenarios. Um, and we're hoping to also collect uh, information, collect the feedback for the teams that are responsible for these constraints uh, on why like, one of the relaxations would make more sense for us or why would it be more helpful uh, for our team in general, or our users at the end of the day. And we're still planning to then do some more feedback uh, from users and, 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 and stakeholders. Um, so just, just a short... Uh, Summary after this, so research uh, that we did, uh, the whole this build versus buy, or let's say buy versus buy decision, uh, took much longer than we expected. Uh, we actually, to begin with, we didn't know what we don't know, I would say. Uh, like the more we dig deeper, we realize that okay, there are more things we have to consider. Um, there are more, more features that, that we could be building that we are not, and we haven't even thought about it. Um, and it, 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 it took us very long to learn about it and, and try them out. The second thing was actually also working with vendors. Um, again, we expected it to be much faster and, uh, and, and it took some time. Um, however, uh, what we've gathered, like what we got during this period, we learned a lot about the current state of the, of the field, of the MLOps, if you want to call them that way. Um, you know, we learned what, is, what, what, are, what are the things, like what are the standard things uh, in the field right, or in the industry right now. Um, and even if you don't select some of those vendors, even if you did spend a month just trying and, and, and building POC with them, and you don't end up buying it, it's okay because we have learned a lot and we can use it in the future um, when we are maybe building something or building some smaller bits of it. Um, and I just want to finish off with users again. Um, I think we did um, turn to them quite a lot. However, I think we still could have done much better. Maybe we could have talked way more with them. Uh, and I think we, as a you know, teams that are building some products, owe to our users to build the best possible uh, products for them to achieve their goals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so again, if you have questions, please raise your hand. And I, okay, I see immediately two hands raised. But first, I'm gonna. Go with the question, with another question. So you talked about uh, research, and you said you did a lot of research, and it took longer than expected. How do you know when to stop research? Because you can do research until you know you're one hundred percent convinced, and you researched everything. Like, how do you know that? Like, now I've done enough, and I'm ready to make a decision. And how yeah. did you do that in your specific case? That's, that's an interesting point, yeah. Um, and I feel like we are facing this right now, like one of us are facing right now, because we've, you know, we've, we've reviewed one platform, we have maybe not completely sold on it, and we don't know what to do with the next ones now. Do we work with them or not? Um, but uh, generally, we, like, as I said, like almo almost always we were trying, at each step of the process, we were trying to focus on, um, on, on, on achieving something. So as I said, we were looking for some deal breakers, for example. So we, we would, at some stages, we would actually have the whole pairing sessions planned with our users. You know, okay, we, would, we will go ahead and, 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 and review this platform with them. But then my team would come over and say, well, actually, I already, by this point, I already know that this is not gonna work. This is, this is a poor platform. And then we cancel all the meetings tomorrow. We don't wanna waste more time. We know that, okay, we have reached a stage where we can make a decision. So for us, it's more about you know, researching until the stage where we, we, we either know that this is not going to work for sure, um, or we, we can compare the two and we can already say which one of the two is better. And uh, at this stage, I think now we are the, where I'm trying to reach this decision. OK, thanks. And now I saw a hand right here. Hello. Um, so I have two questions. Cool. <laughs> First one would be, uh, 
your team's main goal is to have best tool uh, for your user. Uh, so why didn't you... What were the biggest challenges uh, to not build as in your team scope, it's your mission? And the second uh, question would be, how many uh, backlog, I backlog items do you still have after you made all those integrations? So I'll answer the second first. Um, I might have forgotten the first, by the way, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so the second one, we, we still, as I said, we still haven't made a decision up to this date. Um, so because, because, as I said, we were dealing with vendors, so sometimes we would have a week where we can't, you know, can't pretty much do anything, we're waiting for them, so we're actually working on our current platform. At the moment, it's still 100 items. I don't know, this is just something that is haunting me every day. <laughs> it's always 100. Um, so, yeah, to answer your question, it's still 100. Um, the first one, I understand the question is about why, so if it's our mission, why we're not building it ourselves? Um, because our mission is not to build ourselves. Our mission is to make sure that our users can build the, like, the best possible machine learning products. And it doesn't matter if, our, if it's our platform and not our platform, as long as they can achieve that, that's all that matters. It's so cool that you love your users so much. But the question is, how do you interact with them? I assume that's like your community. Can you talk about the process? How do you talk to your users? And how did the process evolve through the iterations of all this? So, sure. I mean, so I think we're quite lucky. You know, being an internal team, uh, it's quite a good position to be in because all your users are basically in this building or, I mean, uh, nowadays it's remote. Uh, but it's, it's, okay, so on Slack. It's very easy to, it's very easy to get access to them, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it's great that uh, at Vinted we have a community where everyone is very helpful um, and, and, and they want to help us in the best way possible. So whenever we need them, um, we can get it. Getting them for an hour is one thing. Getting them for 12 hours, it becomes a bit more complicated, right? So when we, in, in the later stages, when we have like just free vendors, um, asking uh, their managers, so okay, can you devote us some, 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 like some, some of your data scientists uh, for you know, trialing this platform that we may not end up using, they usually look at you and say, well, you know what, you know, I, I can't really do that. Um, but we made a deal that, okay, when we make a short, uh, the list shorter, um, we can we can we can get these these people, um, yeah. So it's uh, uh, again because it's an internal team. I think it's much easier, and and, and I'm you know why not use that opportunity when everyone is around to to to, to talk to them and, and get their feedback. We have one more question in uh, the YouTube comments. So the question is, any hints uh, you've learned how to conduct early qualification of the vendors for the buy option? particularly in such a hot field uh, with a lot of dynamics and predefined standards, et cetera? Um, depends, I guess, depends on your, on your needs. So as I said, for us, uh, well, sometimes they would be unresponsive. They wouldn't even reply for two weeks. So I guess that's the first sign that you don't really want to work with them. Um, second, you know, from a technical, technical evaluation specifically, uh, or technical side, um, we would look at, we would try to look at those key areas where they, they, they cannot do something. So when we had that whole huge list of features that we had, um, we actually had the numbers like zero, one, two, three, uh, and zero. And I was really looking for those zeros in our list, which meant that um, zero was basically this is not supported, it's not supported, and you cannot integrate anything on top of it. Whereas one was okay, we don't have, they don't have this feature but we can integrate with something else, we can build something on top of it. And uh, we were really, really looking and focusing on those zeros, um, and that helped us to, 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 to shortlist our, 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 our list, if I may say. Okay, and uh, any, any more questions in the audience? Yes, no? So thank you, Lucas. Cool, thank you. And now we'll have our third speaker. So, Roman, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this works, yeah? Yeah. 
Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Roman Bugaev and I'm CTO at a company called Flow. Before Flow, I was a solution architect at Adform. And before that, I also was a head of engineering at Payforward that was like it was acquired by Amazon and now it's called Amazon Pay Payment Services. I'm not from Lithuania, I'm not from, from Vilnius. Originally, I'm from Belarus, but now I live in the UK. Um, yeah, and um, before I will start talking about build versus buy, I want to set some context about our company and what we do, because it, it's, it will help you to understand why we do certain decisions and why we uh, select certain vendors and not others. Uh, uh, so first of all, we are number one health and fitness in, in the world. So we are bigger than Fitbit or any other, other health and fitness application. Uh, we are already profitable. We have like uh, quite, a, quite a lot of revenue. 200 millions of users around the world, so like quite big and impressive numbers. And we really passionate about like um, value, so we deliver like real value to our users. So we, let's say we are working on a period tracker for women's, and we help them to get pregnant. We help them to predict, you know, like cycles and so on. And this is real value that we deliver to end users, and we really care about them. Uh, we. Um, our app is basically a super app, so we have like a cycle tracker as a course, and we have a lot of content around like health and fitness. We have different courses, how to master your orgasm, or like how to, you know, you know like prepare like healthy food. Then we have health assistant that can help us to identify different like health issues, and then we have like a social network inside the app, so people or users can discuss you know various very sensitive topics like uh, miscarriage or like abortion or like any other topics that you don't really want to discuss in facebook yep and um, to, so that was a little bit of context about our company and myself so i hope now you trust me that i like we do uh, these decisions well and I want to describe how I make decisions whether to buy or to build something. And for that, I use something called like worldly maps. Actually, it's like, um, in, like it's a special type of maps, but you know, like typically all maps, they connect to some anchors. Like in real world, Earth has, you know, like north, east, west, you know, like, uh, and different, you know, like, Typically, in our like software development uh, process, we don't really use anchors, and we just you know draw some you know like rectangles. We connect them with lines, and this is kind of you know like our architecture, let's say. And this is you know like architecture or something like a Google Photos or something like this. So you have customer, customer can store like images in photo storage. Customer can interact with images through like image manipulation. It's stored somewhere, you know, like you have a data center, this data center powered by some, you know, like electricity supplier. So it's, you know, like kind of very high level, you know, kind of random architecture of like system uh, similar to Google Photos. But, you know, as I said, there is no anchor here. And it's, you know, like uh, it's not, it's not a sit like there is no situational awareness. So it just, you know, like you can move these rectangles as you wish and nothing will change. But we can improve these maps if we will put like uh, some anchor, and I suggest to use like customer as anchor. So basically, you you kind of draw everything uh, in uh, connection to a customer, yes, yeah, so or to your user. And um, as it dimensions, I also like, and we also want to put this in some sort of context, yes, yeah, so like to make this situational awareness as a. Dimensions, I suggest to use like visibility to this customer and also, um, oh, sorry, um, and also uh, evolution of certain like s system, let's say, yeah. And uh, I will give you examples. So the same for Google Photos, but now it's, you know, kind of uh, positioned uh, um, uh, like, uh, so we have user in the center, like it's very visible to user, so it's on top. Then we have like, uh, this is real map for like Flow Health app, let's say for our application. So we have some thing called like health predictions, and we have health profile. We have something like authorization. We have CRM that we have, you know, like feature store to to store like features of our machine learning for our machine learning algorithms. We have some data platform. We have compute and power. Right? And as you see here, like visibility goes down, and you know, like uh, power is, you know, it's very common. Com 
it's a commodity basically it's all like utility nobody think about this in real world and that is why it's here but then if we are talking about health prediction it's like our core and it's something you know not very well established and we are like we are new in this field and then you know you can replace all these components with you know some vendors yeah and basically in our case we we can replace like authorization or like sign up form with our zero and crm with brace and you already know a lot about brace and then we can replace like a feature store with something called Tikton, yeah and then like data platform like databricks power well i'm not sure like what kind of vendor put here because nobody knows like uh, <laughs> power suppliers yeah so basically you know like i've just decided to leave it as it is and this is like a real map and basically you can replace everything almost everything with vendors and uh, but here like in this top uh, corner <laughs> you see some items can be replaced user for sure but then you know like it's very hard to find some vendor who will provide you a cycle prediction because we are the only one company uh, we are the number one company we are the only company who does this and the same about like health profile digital twin so i really suggest you to focus your like efforts and to build everything that is in that corner yourself and everything that is you know like down the line or like on this uh, side i suggest to replace with some vendors but let's go through like all vendors one by one and <laughs> let's like uh, yeah i will put it in a different way so not that easy actually <laughs> so in our like particular case we decided not to use brace at all and there is a certain like uh, reason behind this and i will explain you this later but let's go through the vendors one by one um so like we're built versus buy so how zero it's you know like everyone knows this page like every site has such page and basically you don't really compete by building you know the best experience around like sign up or like login and forget password like experience so basically you can replace it especially uh, it, but it's visible to users so you want to put like uh, to buy some good vendors so we use our zero and also it's very good to use uh, third-party vendor for such tooling because you can make sure that this will be you know very secure uh, it's established you know like um, relatively cheap and so on and you just don't care about this so we decided to buy this but then let's talk about brace so everything almost the same so you like if you buy this you will get you know better time to market better engagement for users but then you know like in order to power this tool you need a lot of data and in our case it's very sensitive data so it's the lines that we don't want to cross like we don't really want to share our data with any other third parties also it can be considered as a core business because like it uh, vendors that helps to engage users into app and basically engagement is very important for the business so basically you want to control this part of the business as well and there is a small caveat here as well it's very expensive at our scale it costs like millions of dollars so uh, we decided to build this tool ourselves and then you know like ticked on so um well as previous speakers told you know it's very you know kind of dynamic field there are a lot of companies who try to build you know a feature store and well it's down the line so we don't really want to build it uh, actually the biggest risk here it's that like in our case we decided to use tecton not a aws sage maker and it's still a startup so it's kind of you know well they well funded but but still it's still startup so we have some risk here but we decided that it's fine to kind of use them uh, so we decided to buy this tool and then databricks you know, you know like um, it's it's i think it's obvious why we decided to buy this because like it's not our core business it will help us not to hire a lot of people because like there are already a lot of components that, that can be reused it provides some security performance you know like reduced time to market so basically everything is good uh, we still like we decided to buy this but we are still waiting for cfo approval and uh, actually I, I have on my laptop i have like all decks that we show to cfo to prove that we need to buy something so if you're interested in these decks i can show them afterwards like in um, um, you know uh, uh, you know uh, on the backstage <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and yeah so basically you know like we decided to buy it's quite expensive but yeah i think we don't really need to build this ourselves for sure we still need to build some of the components of data platform like experiment service 
well, everyone does this. Like you, you heard already about this, and we do the same. So we have our own experiment service. It's built on top of our data platform. But yeah, in ideal world, I will buy this because it's not like our core business to build you know, um, A/B testing tools. Yeah. So well, okay, we bought all those things. We spent you know like our like paycheck for like per year just for these tools, one million, uh, even like more. I don't. I, I can't like, disclose like particular numbers because like um, uh, because we have certain like relationships with vendors and we sign the NDA. But you know like we spent like more than one million just on these tools. And basically, I think that I don't regret that we decided to buy all those tools. And um, yeah. And basically, as a conclusion, uh, I suggest to read about these worldly maps. There is a, there are a lot of nice articles about this tooling. And uh, yeah, I think it's very powerful technique to decide whether you want to buy something or to build. But don't forget about like different constraints that you have inside your business, like privacy, security. Maybe some others, like maybe budget limitations. Yeah. So thank you for your time. Uh, and if you have any questions, <laughs> yeah, you can ask them. Uh, so thank you. Uh, one one quick question I have yeah. is: What's your success rate with the CFO? CFO. Uh, well, I think. Um, well, it's close to 100, but it's still, you know, like very good filter to kind of make sure that we spend our money wisely and they also help us to get more discounts from vendors so like if you have this process with cfo so you can say to vendor you know like well we really want to buy this tool but i need cfo approval and it will be you know really really hard to get it so give me cool discount <laughs> our, our, my my cfo gave me this ad the same advice some years ago <laughs> Uh, it, it, I think it works. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, do we have any questions? Please, please raise your hand. So, we're using one of those tools, Out Zero, right? Yeah, and yeah. it has been down like this year, like four, or five times last year, a few times. And like uh, after you make a decision, buy, and then you get a feedback cycle, and you see that maybe it was not the best choice. Do you have any suggestions, tips, where you draw the line and you say? It's up for a new buy or build uh, cycle, or we choose uh, another vendor or some. Well, typically we we have certain SLA, SLAs with our vendors, so we typically buy an like, enterprise version of so software, so they kind of committed to provide a certain level of uh, uptime or like performance and so on. And I in, I think in case of O zero we have something in place because I haven't noticed you know any downtimes even though we have like monitoring in place and it works just fine for us and uh, i'm not sure why <laughs> yeah but i know that they have this multi tenancy uh, architecture and maybe they use like different infrastructure for different clients so uh, but for sure you, you you need to have something like this so sometimes you need to change vendors and um, i think uh, it's a good idea to have like a plan b in every scenario basically when we use like uh, vendors um, why we use you know um, like in this worldly maps yeah we try not to use vendors that are visible to end users as much as possible in this case you can replace these vendors very easily uh, uh, so and um, if you deploy something that is visible to users, it's much harder to, to change this tool because they kind of, you know, there is an API, they use this API, or let's say there is a like old version of your mobile application and you still need to support it. Yeah, so ideally you need to replace everything that, that is not visible to end users. And O0 is more like exception in our case. Okay, thank you. I think we have one more question. Thanks. Uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry about the lisp. I'm just out of the um, dentist's. Yeah, no problem. Um, and I'll definitely be interested to learn how to convince the CFO. <laughs> so um, I work at the big pharma company where I lead medical device development, and that includes software. And um, when it comes to getting regulatory approval for software where you have medical claims, like FDA or EMA, um, they, have a, they have a particular way how you need to build the software. Uh, does that go into your build versus buy decision? Can you talk about that? 
Yeah, so basically in, in most cases we have this, you know, like uh, like additional like uh, check in our like uh, comparison table whether this vendor like HIPAA compliant, FDA kind of approved and so on. Uh, we don't really need to have, uh, we, we don't really need to be like HIPAA compliant or like we don't really need FDA approval because we more like a consumer applications that kind of help them but we don't really uh, provide like diagnosis or stuff like we don't we don't do this so we don't really need this but we have this um, we try to check this because like at some point of time it might be needed and let's say all zero is HIPAA compliant and Databricks is HIPAA compliant and Tikton is deployed to our infrastructure so we can make them them HIPAA compliant if it's needed or like we can approve these tools with FDA if it will be needed so yeah it's one of our like considerations that we have yeah uh, we have one more que question about Auth0. So yep. the question is why Auth0 and not AWS Cognito? Since Actually, I see you already using AWS. Yeah, yeah. So, well, we almost all in and on AWS. Yeah, we have like very big enterprise contract with Amazon. Uh, but the reason why we decided to buy Auth0 because it has better user experience. And second thing is much like is less expensive, basically. Yeah. So. Cognito cost us like two, three times more than Auth0. I'm not sure why. Maybe like, <laughs> you know, um, Auth0 just decided to get like a new fancy client with a, a lot of users and they gave us like good discount, but we can't achieve the same discount with uh, Cognito. Because they kind of, they have like a public price and can they provide certain discounts for enterprise clients, but discount is very limited. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? So, so thank you again. Thank you. And uh, that's it for today's speakers. Uh, uh, thanks everyone uh, for coming. Thanks those for watching. Uh, we have uh, a bunch more Vilnius Tech Leads events coming up uh, this season. Uh, so the next one is on November 18th. That's the one with accessibility. So we're going to talk about how to make software, how do we make software accessible for our users? Then in January, we're going to skip December because you know Christmas, etc. So in January, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about politics, not the outside of kind of politics, but like internal politics and how we as leaders. Uh, deal uh, with those politics and is politics in the workplace good, bad, etc. And then in February we have the one with first-time managers, in March the one with equity, and in April we have the one with stakeholders, and in May we don't have a, a team for that event yet, but so if you want to speak uh, in that event uh, you, might, uh, you might be able to set the team. So thanks again everyone for watching and for coming. Those uh, here offline. Uh, I hope you'll stay and enjoy drinks and food. And for those of you online, uh, see you next time. <laughs>